This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Good evening. Let me welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, I was just commenting, this is an engineering school, so we ought to be able to fix the microphone, I would think. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, Jim Plummer, the Dean of the Engineering School, and we're delighted to have a capacity crowd here in NVIDIA Auditorium and literally hundreds of others who are watching this event this evening over a live webcast, and so we're w welcome to all of you. Uh, we're here, as all of you know tonight, to uh, honor Professor Brad Parkinson and to induct him into the Stanford Engineering uh, Heroes Hall of Fame. This is um, a very, very special event for us. Uh, there are currently um, 12, uh, 14 actually, uh, people who have been inducted into the Engineering Heroes uh, Hall of Fame, and Brad is uh, the most recent of those. This includes people like uh, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, Fred Turman, uh, Vince Cerf, um, and Craig Barrett, who was the uh, CEO of Intel Corporation. So it's a very distinguished uh, group. These are people collectively and individually who have profoundly advanced the course of human, social, and economic progress uh, through engineering, and they are all affiliated um, often in many ways with Stanford Engineering. We're tremendously proud of all of them. We're also uh, delighted tonight that um, uh, Brad's family, some of them at least, are here tonight. I think his wife, Ginny, and his daughter, Leslie, and his son, Bruce, are here. So welcome to all of you. I've lost track of where you are, but there they are. Right, welcome. And within the audience, there actually are a number of other people, I think, uh, who have made uh, significant contributions to GPS uh, throughout its uh, history and, and evolution and, and more modern and more recent work. Um, I'm, I don't want to start naming names because I'll miss many of you if I do that, but one person I did notice who, who is here is Jim Spilker, and so we'd like to welcome uh, Jim, who made major contributions to GPS as well. So un unlike many um, award events, uh, the only thing that we ask of people who are inducted into the Engineering Heroes uh, group is that they spend a day with us, and we'll set up the day in any way that they want and try and make it a very special day for them. So when we talked to Brad about this, he said he'd like to spend some time with students, and so uh, he and I had the great uh, pleasure of having uh, dinner and spending some time a little while ago with a group of Aero Astro graduate students and undergraduate students, and it was a, a fascinating discussion about uh, both what's going on now and what happened uh, during the year, the formative years of, of GPS. Uh, Brad also suggested uh, the topic of this talk tonight, uh, which is a fascinating topic, GPS for Humanity. I think we're all looking forward to hearing what Brad will tell us both about the past, uh, but also more interestingly, perhaps, about the future of uh, GPS. So as all of you know, Brad is widely known as the uh, chief architect of the GPS system. Um, it's th really thanks to his work uh, as an Air Force colonel back in 1973 that today all of us take for granted the fact that we can know where we are in the world in X, Y, and Z dimensions to great precision. And this, this just seems so simple and so easy today that we sometimes lose track of the amount of work and energy and effort that went into uh, designing and, and implementing the system. Now, many people think of uh, GPS as uh, j just as a way to get directions. I mean, there are more than 2 billion GPS receivers in the world today, and a lot of us use them in our vehicles and other ways to uh, get directions to the nearest Starbucks or wherever we might be wanting to go. But I think what you're going to hear tonight is that uh, there are actually are many, many other very interesting past, present, and future applications of the GPS system. And I don't want to steal any of Brad's thunder, so I'll let him tell you about some of the uh, ideas he has about the future. Uh, in addition to his GPS work, of course, Brad led uh, a group of students and staff here in the Aero Astro Department at Stanford uh, on a whole variety of application areas uh, using GPS systems, ranging from <clears throat> automated plane landing systems to uh, self-driven tractors and so on, and he'll tell you a bit about those. Uh, he also was one of the leaders of the uh, Gravity Pro B project, uh, which uh, a satellite that was launched some years ago that validated to really an unprecedented degree of accuracy Einstein's general theory of, of relativity. Brad also had a very distinguished military career. He you know, received a Bronze Star, two Air Medals, uh, and the Presidential Unit Citation for his service uh, during the uh, Vietnam War. <clears throat> 
Brad, um, in addition to his academic um, uh, enterprises, uh, actually uh, had quite a bit of experience in industry as well. In fact, he was CEO of Trimble for a time period when he took a leave of absence from Stanford to uh, run uh, that company, which obviously is deeply involved in uh, GPS systems. He's, he's, he's received essentially every possible award that could be given to an engineer. He's a member of the National Academy and so on, but uh, probably the biggest of these is the Charles Stark Draper Prize, which is sometimes called the Nobel Prize uh, for Engineers. So Brad is highly recognized for the things that he's done. He's a member of the National Inventors Hall of Fame. So tonight we're here to celebrate um, what he has done throughout his career and uh, listen to a little bit about his uh, vision for the future of the GPS system. And before we let uh, Brad begin his talk, Brad, I wanted to give you and thanks for being with us. This is a replica of the plaque which hangs on the wall just outside the auditorium here, recognizing you as a Stanford engineering hero. So congratulations and thank you for being with us. Wow. Well, good evening. And it's... Uh, a real delight to be here and see a lot of faces that I have known in the recent past, in the distant past, and know currently. I was, I was totally surprised and shocked by this award, frankly. I did not expect it at all. So thank you, Stanford. Thank you, Dean Plummer, School of Engineering, for this recognition. And thanks to my department, I suspect that they had some hand in that, Paringa and Charvel Farhat. Before addressing my main subject, uh, I'd like to reminisce a little bit about Stanford and engineering. Robert Frost had a famous poem, you may recall. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood. Well, I was such a traveler in 1964. I was a young Air Force captain and the Air Force was sponsoring me to go back for a PhD in June, and this was uh, like in March. I wanted to broaden my graduate e experience and so I had uh, deliberately looked at something beyond MIT. And I had, <laughs> we got into that earlier, didn't we? <laughs> I'd already been accepted at the University of Michigan for a program in instrumentation and control. And in March of 1964, a strange coincidence occurred. Another captain showed up, fresh on his way from Stanford to the Pentagon, and he'd been here as a graduate student, and he spoke enthusiastically about the PhD program here. Stanford hadn't even been on my radar screen. So I researched it for about two days, and I quickly chose a new road. I called the Air Force headquarters, and I frantically told them, cancel Michigan and try to get me to Stanford. I'd never applied to Stanford. Neither had the Air Force applied for me, but somehow there was a miracle, you know, the equation and suddenly there's a miracle. There's a miracle. And the Air Force managed to turn things around and about six weeks later, I showed up on the campus as an Aero Astro student. Indeed, I have never regretted switching to that other road and I didn't wait very long to do it. I still revere the wonderful professors I had here. And the classes, they were outstanding. Many of my fellow students became lifelong friends. I think those aspects are still here. They're still major strengths of Stanford engineering. I look back fondly on my 28 years as a professor, and I have just a wonderful bunch of colleagues Per Enga, Bob Cannon, Dave Powell, Dan DeBray, Francis Everett, the indomitable Francis Everett, I should say, <laughs> John Tenor, Jim Spilker, and I see Elizabeth Pate Cornell back there. So uh, that was a wonderful aspect, but it's my PhD students that I have to really acknowledge an enormous debt. They've been creative, they've been energetic, their accomplishments, in my opinion, are truly world class. And I'd like to thank them. I saw a few of them here today. I'd like to thank them all for that experience. So thinking back to the spring of 1964, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. 
So with that, I'd like to launch off and talk a little bit about GPS for humanity. GPS has many applications for worldwide benefit, and uh, some we anticipated, some are very surprising. I'd like to dedicate my remarks to the many aerospace engineers and supporters who labored and sacrificed to make this thing happen. Sometimes we call it the stealth utility, this global positioning and timing service. It's more than simply a satellite system. It's the service that it renders, and it's four-dimensional. So we occasionally think of position, it's just three dimensions. Fortunately, we always have some physicists around to remind us there's one more. But this is truly a worldwide system, and all four dimensions are, are important, and you're going to hear about those in just a minute. This is sort of an outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about the initial studies that were done, rapidly tell you about the GPS design meeting, the key innovations and challenges we had, but most of the talk is going to focus on applications for humanity. I'm going to mention some surprises, two of which were triggered by Stanford, and the innovations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the future and the, the major threat that I see to GPS. John Kennedy said, success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. I don't know who started, who said that the first time. But I'd like to acknowledge there were a lot of parents of GPS. And I'd like to point out this person. This is Dr. Yvonne Getting. He had the vision back in 1960, there ought to be a better system, a better way to do it. And he envisioned a worldwide navigation system, and he sponsored a study the first GPS type, it wasn't called GPS then, the first GPS system study that was done in 1964 to 1966. And this is the front page from that study. The interesting thing, these two gentlemen here, Jim Woodford, Hiroshi Nakamura, brilliant space engineers who put this thing together. The interesting thing was, it was secret. I couldn't even tell anyone about this study and it was not made public until 1979, a year and a half after we launched the first GPS satellite, and six years after GPS had been defined. So in 1972, I was the Air Force Program Director for a competing predecessor to GPS. And our first Air Force proposal was rejected in August of 73, and I was then asked by a Deputy Secretary of Defense to try again. In the fall of 1973, I called a small meeting well away from Los Angeles in the Pentagon. And we held that meeting over Labor Day weekend in 1973. I call it the lonely and darkened halls because it is a fairly lonely place when everyone's on vacation. My purpose was to select a navigation system architecture that combined the best knowledge we had at that time. Perhaps the only light came from the fifth floor up there. And as I recall, we generated more than a little heat at the same time. The only attendees at that meeting were 10 young Air Force officers from my program office, one Naval officer, Commander Bill Houston, shown here, uh, a few people from aerospace, including Frank Butterfield, and these three officers were absolutely key in what we did. All three are brilliant. Gaylord Green happened to have a master's from Aero Astro at Stanford. So you see that there is a, a recurring theme in my talk tonight. I'm certain that surprises you. We converged on a variation of the most challenging of the alternatives that had been developed by Woodford and Nakamura. This chart I'm not going to go into. Uh, obviously, it's more, more complex than you could possibly discuss. But the point is, we picked the hardest one. This lists 14 alternatives and describes their characteristics. What we picked assumed an atomic clock in space, which hadn't ever been done, and a simple, uh, simple clock in the user equipment, with the user actually defining where he was by listening to four satellites. So it's the most challenging alternative. It gave four dimensions, if you will, four satellites in view. It was passive, with the implication that you could have an infinite number of users. And the user did all the calculating. 
So with that as a background, what did the system really look like? Here was the system in September of 1973, and it's virtually identical to the GPS you know today. Four satellites, space-hardened atomic clocks, four ranging measurements, and here comes a new piece of technology. The passive ranging signals, and they were given a technical name, CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, allowed all of the satellites to be broadcast on exactly the same frequency. And you say, what's the big deal? The big deal is that enabled our accuracy and precision that occurred later. And the reason is all those signals were locked together as soon as you received them, but it had never been done before. We had the user equipment. Users obviously include aviation. And then, <clears throat> importantly, we had a control segment on the ground that would watch the satellites, predict where they were going to be 12 hours later, up to 12 hours later, and do that with an accuracy of a few meters after 90,000 miles of travel. So there were a lot of things that were challenging about this, but perhaps the most challenging is the new technology. This is that unique signal. Obviously, a double E would love this thing because it's got lots of ones and zeros there. But what would happen is each satellite had its own code. And by regenerating the code in your receiver, you can wander around in the noise until you find that signal and figure out where it started, and that defines time. So with four of those, you were able to actually navigate. I should at this point uh, acknowledge Jim Spilker, who was a key in the analysis and construction of what that signal would look like. But that wasn't the only challenge. The, uh, the, I, I call this the five major engineering challenges for GPS success. There was certainly demonstrating that CDMA signal and getting all of its characteristics. For example, this prediction of where the satellite would be had to come down to the user on a teeny little pipe of 50 bits per second data. That is a real challenge. The second one, space-hardened atomic clocks. Atomic clocks have been around for probably 20 years, but no one had tried to put them up into the upper Van Allen belt and have them last for any length of time. And that was part of what we were trying to do. I've already mentioned the orbit prediction problem. This one sounds a little mundane, spacecraft lifetime. It turns out if you have a system such as GPS with that many satellites, if the satellites don't last a long time, you're going to buy a lot of satellites. And as a matter of fact, the Russians have tried to replicate what we have. They have a system called GLONASS. It turns out they have never, never been able to approach our lifetimes. Typical lifetimes of their satellites are three years. We have many that are over 20. And it makes the system affordable. Last, and perhaps as important as anything else, we had to come up with a user equipment concept that could eventually be made cheap. In the beginning, it wasn't cheap. It was $250,000 for a receiver. <laughs> Not cheap. There was another aspect of the program. The Air Force really didn't like this program. They liked to buy airplanes. <laughs> and there were many attempts to zero out the budget and stop the program in its tracks. So I was not only directing a technical program, I was also fighting a running gun battle with hostile forces in the Pentagon. And I could never have succeeded in that, and I mean this most sincerely, without mentoring support within the Pentagon. I had GPS Mafia. The GPS godfather was this man. <laughs> this man was the number three man in the Department of Defense. And for reasons that I assume were enlightened, he said GPS was his favorite program, and don't you forget it. And I think he told the Air Force, listen, if you cancel him, I'm canceling a wing of your airplane. So <laughs> as long as he was there, we were guarded. His, uh, his strong support was essential to our success. So the sequel, we've had 53 successful launches, basically into the same configuration that we advocated in the beginning. Initially, we said three planes. And now if you count them up there, there's actually six. Nominally, 24 satellites, 11,000 miles up, three or four continents away, if you will. And when you're using GPS, you're receiving signals 
from satellites 11,000 miles away. It's not a big deal for the space engineers, but think about it. They're a long ways away. I'm very proud of the record we had. We launched that first satellite in 44 months, and that was from a dead start, uh, and it worked very, very well. The uh, Block 1 satellite continued on with 10 launches, then 9 more, 11 more all by Rockwell. The uh, Lockheed Martin Company came through with 12 and then 9 more, and now uh, we're in the middle of 2F. We have uh, two launches already with 10 planned, and we are with Lockheed Martin developing yet another uh, satellite. I, if you look at it, there are 31 of the 53 launches that are still alive for a program that started back in 1978. So in terms of that challenge of lifetime, and I don't take any credit, I give lots of credit to Lockheed Martin and Boeing for developing satellites that could do something like that. Now there are a couple of defining events that I'd like to tell you about and remind you of. Uh, back uh, in 1983, the Russians, Soviets actually, shot down a KAL-007 airliner, which they stated had flown over the Kamchatka Peninsula. I don't know if you remember that. They did that in September 1st, and within roughly two weeks, President Reagan declared to the world that GPS would be available free of charge. That was a big change. And the reason that was a big change, civilians had always used the signal. They were using it already. But this established a place that said, if you use GPS, it's going to still be there next week, next year, 10 years from now. The second thing that happened uh, by another president, Bill Clinton, he ordered the deliberate errors in the system turned off. Up to that point in time, he did this in uh, 2000, up to that point in time, the Air Force had deliberately wiggled the signal a little. So your errors would be up to 100 meters. Unfortunately, what they didn't recognize, I tried patiently to explain this to them, but they weren't listening, is if I put a reference receiver, listen to the wiggles, broadcast them back to the user, the problem is solved. Not only the, the original problem, but you also take out all the natural errors, and you get accuracies down on the order of a few meters. So at any rate, Bill Clinton uh, and his administration recognized, I, I should tell you one little side story. I was briefing the four-star general in charge of US Space Command, and I patiently explained this, and he got it, uh, a fellow by the name of Myers. Nice guy, bright guy. He says, well, I agree with you, but I don't know that I can turn it off. And finally what happened is we needed Bill Clinton to make the decision. So the president had to decide that indeed this was a futile thing to do. But the point is, now that gave the civilians an assured capability and fairly assured accuracy. And that's a good segue into this chart. A little busy, but let me talk you through it because it explains a lot of the applications that we now enjoy. Uh, there are two rows here, the horizontal errors and the vertical errors. I will just tell you vertical typically is about twice the horizontal error, and that's just driven by the geometry. So I'm just going to talk four classes of users. A general user typically experiences raw GPS 2.5 to 10 meters. That's at the 95th percentile. That means only 1 in 20 is going to be worse than errors like that. For aviation, we have a system called WAS, which was kind of invented here at Stanford. Per Inga and some of uh, his colleagues and students helped FAA actually field that system. And that gives you an assured two and a half meters, but more importantly, it tells you if the system isn't working right. And if you think about landing an airplane, you'd like to know that. <laughs> so uh, the next category of errors is something, or a category of capability is something we call real-time kinematic. This is a technique that is local differential and gives you accuracies down on the order of an inch in three dimensions. Pretty good stuff. But then we have survey class receivers that give you accuracy sub-millimeters, sub the width of a pencil lead in three dimensions. And I'm going to show you what the implications are, are of something like that. Now, how many on Saturday mornings have heard a, a couple of MIT engineers called click and clack? You ever heard them? <laughs> yep. 
So they always have a puzzler, so I thought I'd give you a puzzler. Okay, uh, and uh, the puzzler I'd like to give you is why would anyone want to track sheep with GPS? And just as click and clack do, we kind of let that simmer around as I talk about everything else, and then eventually I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's turn to GPS for humanity. And uh, I don't have a prayer of telling you all the applications, so I'm going to sample things I find kind of fun, and hopefully you'll find them fun too. The uh, first and I'm just going to give you the categories right now. Here's the 10 major categories, and your sense, you will sense there's some overlap. They're not as pure as one might like, but certainly aviation, emergency services, timing, agriculture, rescue, recreational and automotive, tracking, scientific, military, of course, and robotics and machine control. So what I'm going to do is sort of sample one or two out of each of these areas, and that's the heart of my, my remarks today. So the first one is one of those three surprises I said I was going to talk about. Back in 74, we knew we could do aircraft navigation. No question about it. The surprise in 1992 is we did hands-off to touchdown, and that was a group of my students led by a gent named Clark Cohen. Here are 110 straight traces of a landing profile. And if you, can you see the little, okay. There are 110 traces, count them. This is one meter, and this is comparison to a laser tracker whose presumed accuracy are these two lines with the implication that what we were, tra what we were doing is far, far better than a meter. We have reason to believe what we were doing is somewhere on the order of a few inches in three dimensions. And it turns out if you have a few inches in knowledge of where the airplane is and a knowledge of what the desired flight path is, you can do 110 if you have a band of really bright graduate students. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of those. Uh, Stu Cobb, I think I saw Dave Lawrence here somewhere. Uh, there he is. Uh, Stu Cobb, Dave Lawrence, Boris Purvan, Clark Cohen, and I've left some of them out. And candidly, they did all the work. But it points out one other thing. They weren't all my students. One of the real hallmarks of Stanford is you don't have to be in a given department to work on something. You can kind of put all the students together in a real team environment. They work on a PhD. They go back to their department. They're all part of Stanford engineering. And I think it's a strength that Stanford has probably better than any other school that I know. So that was a pretty good surprise, but there's a lot of other things that GPS can do for aviation, and this is a partial list, and I'm not gonna work through all of them, but I'd like to pick out something we call pathway in the sky. Pathway in the sky is the idea that you would have a head-up display in an airplane that when you're trying to fly an instrument approach is intuitive rather than a rather than a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of needles. And so what we're trying to do here is show the airplane's future position and tell it you're going to fly through these pentagons. It turns out a pilot can do that one heck of a lot better than he can fly needles. And as a matter of fact, the pathway which is calculated is an intuitive projection of three dimensions rather than simply some needles. It's especially suited for curving or dog-legged approaches. And in fact, Juneau, Alaska has an ex example that is very noteworthy. There's some mountains in the way, and you can't get an electron beam to steer you around those mountains. And as a result, when the fog comes in under normal conditions, it's shut down. It was one of the first places that we went to actually show how well this would work. And I have to give great credit to Dr. Andy Barrows, who ran that. And again, the way we work at Stanford, Dave Powell was his advisor. And this data shows why that's so good. Here, uh, this is air, you probably are having trouble reading this, but that is zero to 100 feet. These are the conventional techniques that are used 
in landing an airplane. And this is the raw instruments, and here's some aiding. And what you can see is even with the best aiding and a skilled pilot, it's still a 50 to 60 or 70 foot error that is characteristic of landing an airplane. Here is Andy Barrow's system, the pathway in the sky, and it turns out you don't need as much training. So it shows that the errors are now down around 20 feet. It helps in an enormous number of ways, if I can get the right chart. It helps in terms of safety. It helps in terms of the intuitive learning of how to fly instrument approaches. And Andy later went off and formed his own company very successfully. And then as all small companies do, he got bought out. <laughs> Next example is something called tailored arrivals. And this was given to me by the chief pilot of United. They are actually, flowing, uh, they're actually flying these uh, experimentally. This shows the approach in of a 747 coming out of Honolulu and going into San Francisco. Some of you may recognize that when you get to that point, you're lined up right at the end of the runway. What's unique is that instead of having a series of descents and altitude holds where you reapply the power and come down in stair steps, you instead do it as a continuum. It's a, four, a true four-dimensional approach all the way down to, to the ground. And it is part of what the next generation air traffic control is going to be. It's just one small aspect, enabled by GPS, of course. So you're not only flying this in three dimensions, you're really flying it in four. And by that I mean, at each point, there is a prescribed time for you to be there. So fitting your piece of macaroni with the next guy's piece of macaroni then becomes a very predictable process. So, um, what are the payoffs? Better safety, less delays, more airways capacity, a smaller fuel and carbon footprint. Now, this comes to the astonishing part, at least to me. The average fuel saved per landing by a 747 is 1,600 pounds, close to a ton. There are, I looked it up, there are over 28,000 commercial flights in the US per day. Now, all of them aren't 747s, and all of them aren't on this flight path. But you can multiply those two numbers together and get some feeling that whatever the number is, it's huge. Let me turn to another area. This is emergency services. Emergency services involved 150,000 GPS units today. The, uh, those users use GPS to pinpoint point their location. If you have a cell phone, GPS is the fundamental way that they know where you are if you have a problem with 911. And that allows them to vector the police, ambulance, whatever, to that location. But there, there's a, another part that's equally important, and that is the part of allowing the dispatcher to precisely track your progress and tell you when there's going to be someone there or recognize if the ambulance or fire truck is not going to make it. Next general area is timing and frequency. Uh, a lot of applications of timing and frequency. Almost all cell phone towers trace their origins of time back to GPS. Banking is used for transactional verification. But I'd like to talk this time about coordinated international time. There's a saying. A man with a watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. <laughs> if that's true, the Naval Observatory has a big problem. <laughs> they have 44 atomic clocks, the greatest ensemble of timekeeping, of uh, precision timekeeping apparatus in the world, I believe, uh, CCMs, Mazers, uh, et cetera. And the point is they use this to keep time coordinated between the United States and Europe and everything else. GPS is the key. That's how it all ties together. And the idea is simply that the users on either side of the Atlantic look at the same satellite, know where they are, and infer where they are in time in the fourth dimension. Uh, in the old days, they used to actually package a CCM clock and fly it across the Atlantic to do this. Clearly, this is a lot quicker. The specified time capability, according to the GPS spec, is 100 nanoseconds. That's 100 billionths of a second. Truth be known, 
we do considerably better than 10, and in many cases down to approaching one nanosecond, according to the timekeepers. Very interesting application indeed. Here's another surprise, at least it was at the time, not a surprise now perhaps. Expected in 1974, we could do land navigation. In 1996, again, thanks to some students, this Mike O'Connor and uh, Tom Bell, we demonstrated automatic steering to an inch, as well as three-axis attitude control to about a degree. And the reason you see these antennas on the roof is they're using differential GPS to determine what the orientation is of the tractor. Now, why would you want to know that? The reason is, if you're doing really precise work, it isn't where the antenna on the roof is. Somewhere behind this humongous tire is a tow bar. You want to know where the tow bar is, and so you have to correct for the distance from here to here, sometimes called the lever arm correction. John Deere was kind enough to send me three quarters of a million dollars and two of these huge tractors, and uh, I was lucky enough to have a bunch of terrific students who were able to put this together. And I should comment, this is the typical accuracies here. You can't quite read them. But I'll tell you, on a rough field, five meters per second, and it's an, you don't want to, unless you have no respect for your kidneys whatsoever, you do not want to go on a rough field at five meters per second. <laughs> but the worst error on the order of three inches, and <clears throat> this is now over an $800 million a year market. And you say, wow, wow, why would that happen? Well, here are all the applications of GPS for farming. And the one I'd like to just touch on is crop spraying. That's herbicides, fertilizers, or pesticides. This chart shows, well, this chart doesn't show it. There are over $18 billion a year currently spent on nitrogen. 30 to 50% of the costs of producing corn or wheat is in the nitrogen. Nitrogen use, as a matter of fact, now here comes a chart. Uh, here's world population in brown, and here is nitrogen use in red. And it shows the nitrogen use is far outpacing the growth in world population. Why is that important? Well, this shows one example of why it's important. This is fertilizer runoff damaging the environment because of oxygen depletion in the area just outside New Orleans. This is down in Mississippi River Delta. It's killing fish, polluting the water. It is a definite problem. Can GPS help? Oh, you know, incidentally, that's one of the grand challenges for engineering that the NAE is sponsoring. So without, with, with a automatic steering, it turns out the overlap, the eight to 10% overlap you know, when you're fertilizing your lawn, you can't tell exactly where you were last time, so you come back and put in a generous overlap. Farmer does the same thing. Uh, Eight to 10% reduction is, poten is potentially there, plus if you have automatic steering, you can run day and night, and incidentally in fog, because if you go over to the valley, many times in the wintertime, when the air is calmest, it is foggiest, and you can't even see where that last row was. So the results are visible. The economic advantage is compelling because it's 8 to 10% of perhaps $18 billion, 1.4 to $1.8 billion potentially. But wait, there's more, <laughs> as the television guy says. If you look at a field, each of these patches is a calibration of the demand for nitrogen. And for example, in the blue area, the demand is 0 to 80 pounds of, of nitrogen per uh, acre. The red area is three or four times that. And the point is, if you can sample this, which is what the industry is trying to do, you can modulate the amount of fertilizer you use to correspond to the little patch you're on. And the 8 to 10% you were talking about is probably very small. It's dwarfed when you start to use this technique. So again, a benefit, hopefully, for humanity. Search and rescue. Obviously, there's lots of search and rescue applications. I'd like to focus, well, and most of you are familiar with OnStar. Uh, if you crash your OnStar-equipped car, they uh, call 
emergency services uh, to wherever you are, and uh, evidently that works extremely well. But what I'd like to talk about is emergency beacons. It goes by this mouthful. It's called an emergency position indicating radio beacon, and I, so we'll just call them a beacon. But you activate it simply by throwing a switch, and it has a GPS coordinate, and it broadcasts on a certain frequency. A satellite picks it up, tells the appropriate authorities you have a big problem here. And those exact GPS coordinates pinpoint where they should go. Case in point, back in 2009, over 955 people were rescued off this ferry boat down in the Philippines that had run aground. Apparently, there was some bad weather coming in, but they got them all off in almost all. There's 10 of them that apparently were lost. But almost all of them were lost because they used a system, as I've just told you about. Another category, recreation and automotive. Of course, you're all familiar with the female voice that comes on and says, if possible, make a legal U-turn. Well, I'd like to talk about geocaching, which is uh, uh, quite a different thing. I, some of you may have heard of geocaching. It's a new recreational activity. Uh, people hide treasures at GPS locations and uh, in little boxes. And uh, then you and your family or whoever go out. And usually, you get the coordinates from GPS. You get close enough. And then you've got a, another whole dimension of a problem, because you've got to locate where the heck that little box is. But Worldwide, it's pretty popular. Over 5 million participants. There's over a million geocaches. So if you want to do this, you go on the web and look up geocaching. And uh, bring your kids or grandkids, because they'll have a good time with it. I guarantee it. Tracking. There's lots of things we can track. Uh, I'd like to focus on one. And that is uh, something you will find a little mundane. And that is concrete trucks. Oh, by the way, uh, recently the Supreme Court had a ruling that uh, the, the police, law enforcement people, cannot put bugs on cars without a warrant. And I personally think that was an excellent decision. It was nine to nothing. And it says if you're going to go track somebody, you better have some rationale rather than tracking just anybody. Uh, but in the case of a vehicle fleet that you own, obviously you're entitled to track it. So the way it works, the way it goes down is this. Here's a concrete truck filled with concrete. And the GPS location, plus a lot of parameters from the truck itself, are all geotagged back to a central location. And then the uh, dispatcher or someone else can look up on a website, find out exactly where that truck is. The advantages, productivity. I don't know if you know much about concrete, but once you mix the concrete up, from that instant, it's getting weaker and weaker. And the longer you keep turning it, the weaker it gets. So if you are a user of concrete, you would like to have a tag that tells you when did they put it in that truck and when did they dump it at my spot? Because it'll tell you whether that concrete is going to fail or not. But there's another thing that happens. We track driver compliance and safety. How fast were you going around the corners? Let me tell you. If you have this, it will spoil your whole day as a concrete truck driver or as an owner because you have five cubic yards of concrete that is rapidly hardening because it isn't rotating anymore. <laughs> I'm certain you understand. So a little story. One of these drivers, I guess he was stopping off to see his girlfriend, and he didn't particularly like the dispatcher peeking in on him like that. So he decided he would solve the problem and brought some aluminum foil from home and carefully covered up his display. <laughs> I think his job's in some jeopardy. <laughs> Another application that's, uh, I think, interesting and I don't think violates the, the warrant problem is tracking your own child. And you can put a GPS device on them, and there's an app that tells you exactly where that child is, as well as possibly communicating with them. My third surprise, um, back in 1974, we thought we could do surveying to about a meter. And the surprise is, because we can do reconstruction of the carrier, we can do it to that millimeter. And here's where it pays off. We can use it to measure 
the motion of tectonic plates almost continuously. This uh, shows the instabilities. They're called the Juan de Fuca instabilities. And this is the Juan de Fuca plate. And this is the North American plate over here. And these are velocities measured by GPS. Just to calibrate you, the length of that arrow is one inch per year. And these are measured in three dimensions. Uh, my takeaway from this chart, incidentally, you saw, see this long green line here? Uh, my takeaway is I'm glad I don't live in Seattle because the Juan de Fuca plate is coming. <laughs> However, uh, but we can also see the fine grained motion of tectonic plates. And this shows a series of relatively slow earthquakes. This is horizontal displacement. And in Canada, there's a place where these events occur about every six, can you see my pointer up there? Yeah, OK. Um, in Canada, these events occur about every 16 to 18 months. And they reflect a continuous motion, but also a series of reliefs of stress. In other words, at this point, it is almost predictable, those motions, almost. But we're not quite there yet. And to calibrate you, there is one inch. So, no, hello. There is one inch. So what it is doing is telling you uh, two uh, millimeter accuracies the relative motion of tectonic plates. And when Loma Prieta went, for example, I had a couple of geodetic receivers. And another one of my, professor, uh, one of my professor friends here says, can I borrow them? Put them on either side of Loma Prieta. Well, when it gave, it was this. But it turned out for the next week or so, it kept creeping. And that was a motion that's very, very hard to measure any other way. Uh, so there's a lot of other ways in which surveying is uh, a major application of GPS. I've shown some here, dam deformation. And then there's a whole series of things that relate to machine control. Scientific, lots of applications. GPS routinely measures the figure of the Earth. It measures where the center of the mass is. It routinely has to know where all the little lumps are or you could not do that prediction 90,000 miles away. But I'd like to look at something entirely different. I'd like to look at migratory tracking. This is a bluefin tuna, arguably the most magnificent fish that has ever been on the face of the Earth. These things can go very, very fast. You may not know it. They are actually warm-blooded. They can actually increase their internal temperature by 20 degrees, which gives them a tremendous advantage over the fish they're preying on. But what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the scientists have been pleading that we need to stop fishing them. We're killing them. And this is the chart that is the evidence. The, uh, the biomass has apparently gone down to uh, a small fraction of the historic levels. Where does GPS fit? The east and west side of the Atlantic got in a big argument saying, we'll do ours, you do yours. These things don't mix. GPS pointed out that was not true. These show the actual paths tracked of tuna fish. And it's clear east and west is the same biopopulation. And you better manage them all together. Another example, GPS for humanity. Here is a, uh, something being developed by HP. It's tests. A fight, it's a fight against malaria. And it's in Botswana. You recognize that by the Botswana flag, perhaps? <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, but the point is, the data is collected in a very simple smartphone app. This nurse records cases of malaria. Because what the doctors and the people who are concerned about outbreaks of malaria would like to know is, where's the, where's the concentration? Where should we focus our activities to stop it? And what this does is feed a big database so that they can pinpoint exactly where that con those concentrations are developing. And the goal is, of course, to help wipe out uh, malaria. And I think that's a, a major thing that uh, has been taken on by this country. There's a lot of military applications. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, it turns out the military funds GPS, uh, by and large. But I'd like to just talk about rescue. And this was an example from 1995. This is uh, Captain Scott O'Grady. You may have followed that 
in the paper back then. He was shot down and evaded capture for six days and then was plucked out by the uh, activities of the uh, Marine and Navy rescuers. He attributed his success to his faith in God, the courage of his Marine and Navy rescuers, and his GPS unit, <laughs> which he referred to as his guiding light. Nice example. Uh, the last major application area I'm going to discuss just briefly is that of robotics and machine control. Uh, here's a bulldozer, and you notice it's got two, if you look closely, two antennas there that measure three-dimensional position and tell you exactly where the bottom of that blade is. The point is that in so doing, you can have anyone driving the tractor. You go directly from your digital map of what you want the landscape to look like. In his cabin, he sees green means dig, red means fill. And that's all he really has to know. As a matter of fact, there is even on the market today an automatic system that measures this and a centimeter level accuracy automatically positions that blade. The savings, no surveying is needed, fewer mistakes, and quicker competition. Now, there's another GPS application area that I did not discuss. And I'd like to just touch on it. That's this area. <laughs> And I have four examples from guess where? Very bright audience. Four examples from uh, Stanford. This is the autonomous model helicopter that won a national competition uh, done by Bob Cannon and his students. GPS was used to measure 13 things. Position, velocity, attitude, attitude rate, and time. Count them, 13 things. And it was controlled by GPS alone. This is a robotic GPS sailboat done by one of my students. He did all the work. This is a marvelous uh, device. He took an old catamaran hull. He designed this airfoil that uh, looks like a sail, but it's really an airfoil, and showed that he could go out in San Francisco Bay and control this within a meter in the face of variable currents and variable winds, hands off. Real tour de force, he's now a professor at uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, this is the Stanford robotic car. I will say a few more words about that in just a minute. It won one of the early DARPA challenges, but I shouldn't over-exaggerate. There's a lot of good competitors out there, Carnegie Mellon and other universities doing the same thing. And the last is a robotic snowcat done by Peranga and his student Gutorm Obachog. Now, you will not be surprised to learn Gutorm is a skier. <laughs> Matter of fact, a very, very good skier, and his PhD thesis involved controlling that, and he did it very well indeed. Uh, so I asked the question, why has GBS became a system for humanity? It's effectively a worldwide utility. Well, the signals are free. They're guaranteed. Accuracies I've shown you down to a millimeter. Availability close to 100% worldwide and the receiver cost itself is dropped out of the picture. It's about $3 for a really good receiver. Now, that doesn't include the antenna and the display and all that, but the cost advantage is in the applications and the GUIs, the graphic user interfaces. And that's where the real payoff is for a company or for the application and the user, because the applications generally enhance safety, improve productivity, or they're just convenient and fun. Now, if you think about it, that availability 100% of the time has been taken for granted. And I think we should acknowledge the Air Force and your tax dollars continuing at work. Here are the current developers, Lieutenant General Polakowski down there in Los Angeles and working directly on the GPS program, Colonel Bernie Gruber. But that's the development side. There's also an operational side that keeps those satellites always broadcasting. And that's done by Lieutenant General Susan Helms at the 14th Air Force at Vandenberg and Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Grant at the uh, 2nd Space Operations Squadron in Colorado Springs. And I cannot help but mention <laughs> Susan Helms <laughs> got her master's degree in aeroastro from Stanford. 
and she's also flown on the space station four times. Uh, very, very wonderful graduate. But on top of that structure is this man, and that's General Willie Shelton. I have great fondness for him. He stands up for all the users. He regards himself as the chief steward of GPS for the world. And so if you ever see him in the hall, say thank you. OK, uh, now it's time for the big quiz question. Back to the puzzler I posed earlier. And it turns out what these sheep were doing was trying to trace the Chernobyl radioactivity paths. And Professor David Last of the University of Wales was trying to see if the radioactivity was somehow getting into the grass and hence into the sheep and hence into people. He found out there wasn't any. But at any rate, uh, it's a good puzzler. <laughs> what's next? Well, let me just rapidly say a few things about what's next. Right now, you as civilians rely on a single GPS signal. What's next is the next GPS satellites, four new signals at two new frequencies for civilians, GLONASS, the Russian system, four new signals at two new frequencies, Galileo, the European system, four new signals at two new frequencies, and the Chinese compass, and the Japanese system. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is my time up? <laughs> OK. And the, and the Japanese have a regional system. The point is, all those signals we don't have today. They all represent things that are a true opportunity. And I'd like to just mention one that is fond, I'm, uh, that I'm very fond of. The toughest, uh, the biggest problem with a car is there's a human behind the wheel. You know, that's where most of the problems are. They're not failed brakes and stuff like that. And as a matter of fact, in the last 10 years, over 300,000 people have died on our highways. And not to denigrate the soldiers, but 213 people have died on highways for every soldier that died in Afghanistan during the same period. The point is, this is an enormous opportunity. And can all of those GNSS signals do something for us in that regard? I think it can, and I call that brilliant autos. We can implement a system that uses not just GPS, but GPS, miniature electromechanical systems, radars, cooperative tracking with other cars. I'll tell you where I am if you tell me where you are, so you know in a fog if someone has stopped right in front of you. Or you can anticipate if the road friction is not good enough. All those things are possible, and you say, well, that's not very new. It isn't. We have driverless cars already. This shows Junior from Stanford and Odin from Virginia Tech. And they went on a course on a deactivated Air Force Base, George Air Force Base. And they had to follow the rules of the road and everything like that. It was a DARPA challenge. Uh, so that's a start. And then we have this. Sebastian Thrun, director of, uh, was the director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligent Laboratory. has been instrumental in the Google driverless car application. And how about this? Those cars are being driven without a human at the wheel. That is an autopilot convoy. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that there are two hands of each of those drivers stuck out the window. <laughs> you caught the don't drive this at home, right? Don't try it at home. So driverless and automatic cars, I think, uh, are something that's coming. You see degrees of it in Mercedes and some of the other cars already. Electronic stability control, lasers and radars, all helping you see how fast you're approaching another car. Camera-based lane keeping. All of those, to me, that represents a real future opportunity, both in terms of PhD dissertations, but also <laughs> in terms of a real market. So all the good news. What's the bad news? The number one worldwide issue, in my opinion, is spectrum interference. And it could come in a lot of forms. I'm going to highlight just two of them briefly. This is a GPS jammer. 
You can buy it on the web for about 33 bucks. It is illegal to use. It turns out one of these was operating in a truck right near Newark Airport, and I think operated for two months. And they knew it was out there somewhere, and it kept driving by and shutting down one of the monitor stations for the wide area augmentation system. And when they finally found it, they prosecuted him to the fullest extent of the law. They took his device. <laughs> now, in Australia, if you were to do that, you're facing jail time and a $100,000 fine. And I frankly think we have to get our act together in that regard. Here's the, uh, here's the part of the license jammer. And this shows the GPS signals. And these are frequencies. And it says GPS receivers can tolerate any signal whose power is below this blue line. And the situation before the proposed licensing of a certain company was just a communication system from satellites, 40 watts at 22,000 miles, about the same power level as GPS, not a problem in an adjacent. We can tolerate that quite easily. Then the FCC, in their great wisdom, can I say that? <laughs> that wasn't facetious, was it? OK. So, the, light, the SCC proposed licensing a company that would broadcast powerful signals from the ground. And those signal levels look like this. Uh, and I can't even draw it. It's it, a billion times greater than GPS. A billion times. That's a teaspoon of water once a second compared to Niagara Falls. That's a billion times. And uh, you can see what the problems are. It will trespass into GPS, but more importantly, a GPS receiver, and we tested them to find this out, can reach out and kind of listens into the adjacent band. And fortunately, I think this has been shut down, and we don't have to deal with it again, uh, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, now, one little piece of philosophy here. Uh, I've been asked many times, what was the driving philosophy behind the GPS program? in those early perilous times. And frankly, I didn't answer the question very well. But about three months ago, I stumbled on something that I thought really, really distilled what we were all about. And um, it was chiseled in granite on a sundial, I'm not making this up, outside the LA train station. And there are three phrases on this granite. The first phrase is vision to see. So if I think back to those times, I think everyone that worked for and with me had the vision of what this could be. The second line is the faith to believe. You have to believe you can really pull it off in spite of just seeing some airy thing. And the third line is the courage to do. And I tell you, there were a lot of people that I stand in awe of who worked for and with me that put in long hours, jeopardized families. They did a lot of things to make GPS happen. And we all owe them a great debt. I'm enthusiastic about what we have done, but a little in awe of some of the prices we had to pay. But having said that, it turns out probably every one of your heroes would say, yeah, that's what we did. So it's the foundation of many engineering achievements and kind of distills the whole deal. I can't finish without acknowledging the wonderful help of my delightful wife, Jenny, and all my children and grandchildren. Their enthusiastic support has been essential. So on behalf of, of all of us who had that faith to believe 39 years ago, thank you. GPS success is a tribute to the whole team of the developers, the innovators, Stanford and elsewhere, manufacturers, supporters, and let's not forget also to you, the users. Thank you.
Now comes the PhD orals, is that it? <laughs> I already got my degree. Yeah, I think we're going to stipulate a pass. Uh, folks, uh, we have questions both coming in on Google Moderator from the remote viewers, but also we welcome yours. Uh, would you like, yes, sir, please. Hi, Winston Copeland. Thank you very much for your words. Question for you. Since our military depends so heavily on GPS, what do you recommend we do to preclude our enemies from denying us access to GPS? Uh, you said it in an interesting way. Um, that is one aspect of the problem. And it turns out um, many people have agonized over the possibility that somebody like that light squared thing would jam our, our system. It turns out we know ways for airplanes or trucks. We know ways to put directional antennas. We know ways to deeply integrate that signal. We know in the case of the military that we can use two frequencies rather than one. So I don't want to downplay that threat. An equal threat is that they use our system or their own. And frankly, the only way we're going to fix that is to jam it. We're going to have to jam them out in a military area. So I am not advocating, and obviously you have to do that very carefully. You have to avoid any impact on civilians. And I, that is a dilemma. We, we kind of let that one you know, out of the jar, and it's there. I can't think of probably anything that has, is a great benefit to mankind, humankind, that somehow doesn't have a downside, and the downside could be that. Thanks, Brad. Um, why don't we commutate between here and the remote uh, viewers. Uh, the number one voted question is, if you had it to do again, would there be a technical feature of GPS you might tweak or change? Uh, th th that's a good question, and, and you have to put it in the context of what we had available then. I mean, you can't conjure up something that doesn't or would not have existed. But I'll tell you something that is probably not well known. When, I first, when we first built that system, there was a second civil frequency. Hmm. And there was a little switch in the satellite where you could send out, because we were power limited, at least as the uh, solar panels aged. And so you could put that switch in the civilian second frequency or the military. The next generation of satellites did not have that capability. The military realized they were power limited and could not afford to let the civilians have it. And furthermore, they were still in the mind process of dithering that signal. And who the heck needs ionospheric correction, which is what it's used for. Oh, I did, I, let me uh, back up this minute. So uh, right now, the military corrects the ionis. There's a group delay because of all these free electrons. And it's an error unless you calibrate it. But it turns out it goes as 1 over frequency squared. So if I measure it at two frequencies, there's a little algebraic relationship, and I can sort out what the error is. So you, you would like to have two frequencies. So now to answer the question, I would have ensured that there was a second civil frequency on. That's uh, certainly one thing I did. And then there's a technical thing that I would have done. I would have gone to a longer acquisition code for civilians, but uh, you, that's a little esoteric, but I, I just think that would have been better. Okay, thanks. There's a... Uh, and incidentally, uh, obviously now, for the newer generation satellites, I would advocate the second and third frequencies and the four additional signals. Thanks, Brad. A question from the floor? Yes, I think you were first. For your transmission. How did we pick the L band frequency we're at, which is 1575? It turns out it's a, a trade off. If you go lower in frequency, the effect of the ionosphere is greater because it's 1 over frequency squared, a smaller number, makes a bigger error. Uh, so the lower you go in frequency is a problem. On the other hand, if you go higher in frequency, the wavelength is shrinking, and hence an omnidirectional antenna is getting smaller and smaller. And it turns out L-band is about the sweet spot. And that's the reason a lot of people like L-band, and that's the reason we get in these elbowing matches with other people who would like to steal our, our uh, spectrum. <laughs> Dirty guys. <clears throat> Brad, there's a corollary uh, question from Google. 
which is, gosh, with all these problems with interference, why don't we just increase the GPS power by a factor of 10 or 100 or so? Uh, I don't know if you know how expensive it is to create power in space. You know, it's not like you take your 63 solar panels from your house and just sort of stick them up there. Those solar panels are very special. They have to withstand um, solar radiation, particularly the Van Allen belt at our, our altitudes. So the point is doubling the power amounts to doubling the solar arrays. And pretty soon that's a fool's errand because I can, I can get a lot more uh, resistance to interference by doing things to the user equipment and et cetera. However, having said all that, the military has a process or a plan of possibly putting a big dish antenna and in certain areas of the earth, focusing that power down a little more. I, I think that's a very expensive idea, and I, I would much rather see them instead going to the kinds of things we know how to do, vector, vector receivers, which Jim Spilker has advocated for a long time, especially when we have you know, 50 or 60 satellites on orbit. A question? Yes, sir. Uh, can you maybe tell us about a time that was the <clears throat> darkest hour of GPS, maybe a time when you thought, man, this is never going to work, and how did you get out? <laughs> oh, there was a dark time. <laughs> a dark time. <clears throat> Turned out I had never taken a vacation. And uh, for various reasons, I went off for a week. And I had, when I left, I thought I had this humongous reserve. I thought I had a 10 or 20 percent, and it was towards halfway through the year, and I had a 10 or 20 percent uh, reserve in my budget. And, you know, that's one of the things you manage for. It turned out, during the week, three things hit me at the same time. The launch vehicles announced that the cost of a launch was going to double. The people that were doing the user equipment said that their equipment was going up and the control segment had a terrible problem. I came back to discover that I didn't have a surplus anymore. I had a negative surplus. That's called an overrun. <laughs> and uh, for the next three months, we fought like heck for survival because the Air Force was going to take any opportunity to shoot me. Matter of fact, got to tell you a little story. The Air Force really really didn't like this program. And so I was, in my normal fashion, going back to Washington once every week or two and talking to everyone, telling them it's OK. I, I tell them all the problems, and we fix those, and here's the new problems. Except I'm walking down the halls of the Pentagon, and all of a sudden I see this major general coming towards me. And I know who this guy is. He's a West Pointer. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm trying to sort of walk around him, and he maneuvers right, and it, suddenly he's, he's about that far away. And his forefinger is protruding from my chest like this. And he's saying, Parkinson, your otherwise brilliant career is going to go down the tubes unless you stop advocating this system. What do you suppose I said? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and totally ignored him. <laughs> Uh, sir, go ahead. The Air Force view it now. <laughs> oh, uh, they're enthusiastic converts, but of course it took a couple of wars. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and the whole armed forces. Uh, th <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's an army colonel, uh, and maybe you read this in that paper that I wrote, but there was an army colonel, and I think it was Second Iraq uh, War, who uh, was asked, do you need any space systems? And he says, no, I don't need those darn any, you know, fill in the blanks. He used a bad word. Uh, space systems, as long as I have my space communication system and GPS. <laughs> he didn't need it. <laughs> I think he thought it was magic. <laughs> Brad, ah, um, right, that gentleman right there. Side on the physical side of the size of the satellites you use for um, transmission? That is an excellent question. I can tell you're going to be an engineer. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is my pseudo grandson, by the way. 
Uh, it turns out the way we launched the satellites was on a refurbished Atlas F, an old intercontinental ballistic missile that had been stood down. And it turned out that the size that we used was as big as you could launch. And it turned out that those uh, refurbished uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles were the cheapest way to get into space. So it was driven by cost and capability. In other words, we couldn't make it any bigger because we couldn't launch it cheaply. Good question. Sorry. You, sir. When a satellite fails, you somehow just shoot it back down and get it out of orbit. Ooh. <laughs> no, you sure don't. Uh, as any, um, a, uh, you're not an astro major, sir, so I, uh, I will tell you it takes almost as much energy to get it down as it does to get it up. So it's a lot cheaper to throw it out somewhere. And so what they do is they preserve a, a certain amount of propellant and boost it up to a higher altitude, which unfortunately you can think of as a junkyard. I don't like that, but it's the only thing we have today. Uh, ideally, what you'd do is kick it out into an orbit around the sun, but nobody does that. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Speaking of the sun, what are your plans about triple solar flares to deflect them? And as I can see, your bent is saving energy. Are you going to capture them? <laughs> um, well, the immediate problem of solar flares for GPS is is very unlikely it would actually harm the satellite. But what it does is pump the ionosphere. And it, it puts so many active um, ions in there that the, it, it tends, rather than simply delaying, to make the ionosphere look opaque to the radio waves. And frankly, so far, at least in the United States, in the temperate zones, We've not had a big problem with that. But it's something to be concerned about. And it's something, as a matter of fact, our friends at the FAA, when they're talking landing systems, have to take into account. And a lot of the research that goes on under PAIR is aimed at the integrity problem, aimed at ensuring if GPS gives you an answer, it's right. And it's one part in how many times? 10 to the seventh. 10 to the seventh. One, only one time in 10 million times can that GPS lie to you. And that's the, uh, that's the standard. I'm glad it is. But it sure gave us fits for a while. We tried to get the WASP system installed. We, Pear and others, tried to get this uh, FAA system working. And we had millions of data points that showed it worked great. And they said, you haven't even begun to prove it. What did we merge two years later? Bloody, <laughs> bowed. <laughs> but we finally succeeded in doing it. The point is, the FAA insisted that it meet those high, high standards. Now, so what's the consequence? The consequence is, if it doesn't think you possibly, one time in 10 million, have the right answer, you don't get any answer. And so, Mr. Pilot, don't depend on this. And you know, frankly, that's the right way to look at it. Yeah, that was, uh, that was good fun. The, the, <laughs> the tricky part was that they wanted the 10 to the 7 points during the Iono storm yeah, that right. you talk about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Please. Hi, was there any aspect of this that could be attributed to dumb luck as opposed to hard science? <laughs> <laughs> if you're talking, did everyone hear the question? Is there any aspect of this that could be attributed to dumb luck rather than science? Well, I, I got to tell you, I'm a lucky guy <laughs> in terms of having run it. And, and I, I probably have the right background, the right guy, et cetera. But you still look back on life, and you see all Robert Frost's little forks in the road that somehow you did this, that, and the other thing. So in terms of what happened, in terms of in terms of being able to get some key officers, for example, maybe that was dumb luck. In terms of the design, eh, there wasn't much dumb luck in there. We, uh, I don't think so, anyway. Well, it stood the test of time. Uh, and I, uh, I don't know if there's another dimension of that answer. I think I'll let it go with that. Good question. 
for the nation, I think there was a colonel who took the job. And that was you. Yeah, he, you know that story, right? No, they don't. Please. So I am, I am, I'm like a kid in a candy store, not on GPS. I'm, I am the chief engineer for a program called ABRES, the Advanced Ballistic Reentry System, SPO. And I am designing maneuvering reentry vehicles and the controls problems, oh, wonderful, complex control problems. And I've been doing this for a while and the three-star general calls me into his office. And I'd gotten a hint about this. And he said, well, we'd like to, oh, and, and I, 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 on this program, I was, I was a colonel, but I was working for a two-star general. And he said, Brad, spend the money any way you want. <laughs> you know, $100 million a year, it's quite a bit. So this, uh, the three-star general in charge of the whole operation called me into his office. And here's the dumb luck part, maybe. And he said, uh, I'd like you to go over and run this floundering program uh, on navigation satellites. And I said, I, uh, and, you know, get, get this. I three-star general, sort of a godlike figure, and I'm sitting there looking him in the eye. And he said, uh, yeah, I'd like you to go down there. What do you think of that? And I said, well, general, if you do that, am I going to be the program director? He looks at me, and he says, no, I can't promise that. And I said, in that case, I'm not a volunteer. And he didn't expect that answer at all. <laughs> because I got about 15 feet outside his office, and he transferred me anyway. <laughs> Is that the story you were? OK. He's heard it before. Any, uh, yes, sir? I've been flying with GPS probably for 20 years or so. And I just uh, listened to your 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 7th uh, errors. But I can tell you, you know, 98% of the time it's right on, on. And 2% of the time it says I'm three miles over this way or five miles over that way. And I've carried two different GPS receivers with me. And uh, does that sound like something you've encountered? Uh, it sounds right. like you don't have an FAA certified receiver. Yeah. Well, that's true. Well, <laughs> no, that makes a big difference. All receivers are not created equal, and I'm certain you have a nice receiver, but getting to the point of certification is a hard problem. And I, again, I wouldn't know what, what the problem would be, and I wouldn't want to defend that GPS is always right. But if you're listening to 12 or 13 satellites, which you can when you're in the air, there should be enough cross-checking that if something is going wrong, you should know it. And we call that RAIM, Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. Could it be the algorithm inside the GPS receiver? It could. It could. It could. Sir. From the auto industry, they would have blamed the mapping software, not the. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick question. Uh, can you estimate how much the public GPS system costs the government per year to run? And I'm not an MBA student, by the way. How much the public GPS system? Uh, w w w um, you can't, it's all one system. So, you can't actually separate it. But I, I think I know where your question is going. I think the budget for GPS is close to a billion dollars a year. It's a lot of money. But you see, it's the enabler for every precision weapon system in all three services. It is the basis for next gen, the Air, FAA's air traffic control system. And by the way, when people have studied this, they've come to a, a, an interesting conclusion that the taxes paid by the industries that are supported by GPS more than pay for the system. Now, that doesn't present, uh, prevent um, politicians from trying to add taxes, because you know the politicians want to take the money in and then dole it out to their friends and stuff. <laughs> Brad, our minders have suggested that we take no more than one more question. Is there one more question on the floor? Yeah. <laughs> I saw that hand first. How long do satellites last, and are you limited by radiation damage in the solar cells, or the electronics just becomes obsolete, and you just want to get rid of it? That is a great question. The, uh, it turns out the average on lifetime, uh, average lifetime on orbit right now is somewhere around 11 years. But that doesn't say that that's what's going to happen. We have at least, I think, three or four satellites over 20 years old. 
We have triply redundant clocks. We have dual redundant power systems on the output. We have an extra uh, gyro in terms of attitude there at the apices of a regular tetrahedron. So it, it turns out the answer to your question is usually the solar panels slowly degrade and frequently the clocks, you, you start to use the backup clocks and pretty soon you don't have enough. Uh, if it's done right, it's like the one horse shea. You remember the poem about the one horse shea? It fell apart, it, it went like crazy and then all of a sudden everything went wrong. And that is the ultimate in designing a satellite, you see, because then you have not added too much reliability on anything. Okay. Brad, um, I certainly. I, Thank you. Thank you, Pear. Uh, we have a reception planned. Uh, there should be food and drink outside. We're welcoming you all to stay uh, for, for a while at least, and I think Brad will be around for a little while longer for sure. additional questions. So let me just thank you one more time and uh, just My tell pleasure. you that you are our hero. So thank you. Wow.